Welcome to Health Oddity, the show that strips away the jargon and hype surrounding all things health and fitness to help you live a long, strong and energetic life. Lining up at the bar this week, here's Peter Lant, Paul Bassett and James St. Pierre. Welcome to the Health Oddity podcast. My name's Paul Bassett and today I'm going to introduce you to the usual people. Last week I wasn't here, so I know you all missed me. Uh, just couldn't make the time zone difference. Uh, I was I was busy. I, I, I had a job, but it turns out that maybe Peter and, and <laughs> James didn't. Uh, no, I'm joking. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, please say hey, Peter. Hello, how we doing? If you're watching, I haven't got 10 years younger. I've just had my hair cut. <laughs> it's been a long time coming. Six months, mate. <laughs> Is that why you went down to Devon? Because they have shears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just chucked yeah. me. They chucked me in the sheep dip as well. So I had a wash. So in the last six months, I've had my haircut and a wash, wow. whether I need it or not. <laughs> and hey, James, how you doing? I'm very good. Very excited for this episode today. So uh, looking forward to it. Yeah, over the last kind of year of doing this podcast, I've been really lucky to speak to some of the best best people out there in the fitness industry. People that perhaps are underlying what you see in the magazines, and they're really the the, the the thought leaders, you know, to use a corporate term, the thought leaders out there who are really pushing the industry forwards, have got not only are they conveying the information in in ways that are is, is easy to understand, they're also developing systems and approaches that are really quite cutting edge and really fascinating, and really have not just a crossover for the athlete but for everyone else. So this week, really happy to invite. Steve Maxwell onto the podcast. Thanks for coming on, Steve. Hey, um, uh, I appreciate you having me on. Thank you very much. I'm quite honored. Oh, great. Thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, we've just to give some background on Steve. Steve is, um, you know, to use that word thought leader again, some, Steve, Steve's name crops up wherever you're starting to look into serious fitness information. And not only has Steve probably tried it, he may have originated it. Um, he has got a background that's varied from wrestling, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He's extremely, extremely well-respected within that scene. I say scene, it makes it sound like a music scene, but it, <laughs> the, that discipline. Um, also, early adopter of the kettlebell when it started to make waves back in 20-odd years ago in the States. You know, in the UK, kettlebells came over a little bit later, obviously. They were back in the 19th century, but there was just a long time where no one was using the kettlebell. And Steve was one of the people who started to spread the word around that tool. But more importantly, and one of the reasons we, we want him on this podcast is Steve has an unbelievable level of fitness and he's maintained that for many, many, many years. And he's not only taught people how to excel at their sport or in just their wellness, he's He's, he's taught them how to do it safely and to listen to their body because every 10 years, your body goes through some kind of change. I know that's, that's putting a kind of strict mark around it, but what we do notice is that every 10 years, we have to deal with a different set of that responsibilities and things like that. And the training sometimes has to adjust. And if you're intelligent about it, you can have the exceptional level of strength and fitness that Steve currently has. But also Steve is interesting because Steve, you're not, you don't have a fixed abode. And so you've really adapted the way uh, you train because uh, you don't live in one particular place. I know in the pandemic that may have changed, but uh, certainly when I came to know about you, you were traveling the world. Um, and so you're extremely efficient with the way you train, which is also a really interesting thing. So if you don't mind, um, could you kind of give our listeners a little bit of a background of what makes you tick and why you were in the fitness industry, if you even call it that. <laughs> well, I started back in 1972 as an undergrad, uh, health and physical education major. And uh, I, I worked at the first Nautilus gym in uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Nautilus was huge back then, high intensity training. Uh, Arthur Jones, a lot of people have never heard that name. Um, he, he, he was a real, uh, uh, he created a whole movement of high intensity training back in, in, in that era. And then uh, teaching school and eventually uh, working at many different fitness centers, uh, eventually ended up owning my own place called Matricide. I opened up in 1990. 
And um, that was the first of many. Uh, it was the first super slow guild uh, certified training facility. Uh, later, I got more away from that type of training uh, into the kettlebell. Uh, first B, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Academy in the Eastern United States, well before Henzo Gracie or Mike Donaher or, you know, Marcelo Garcia or any of these guys. There was Steve Maxwell. And uh, after that era, uh, divorce, you know, <laughs> I, uh, I took to the road. I actually moved in a camper van and lived for three years. It's something I always wanted to do. I was always a minimalist by nature. And uh, from there, I, I realized that knowledge is marketable and there's a real thirst for for knowledge people wanted to know what was in my head and i realized that i could go out and teach seminars and workshops so i started going uh traveling that was another thing i always wanted to do and for almost 15 years i lived as a, uh, a digital nomad pretty much traveling from country to country not staying in any one place more than just a few weeks at a time 15 years. And then some people may laugh at this. <laughs> I've, I've taken grief for it before, but uh, I used an astrologer for years. This guy's very good. And uh, if you want to uh, check out starcenter.com, if you want to check this guy out, and uncannily accurate. He told me about this pandemic a year before. He said, hey, look, in 2020, you want, you're going to want to get off the road, go back to the U.S., to be the best place for you and just find a place to hole up. So I listened and I did. And I bought a tiny house and I set it up in Washington state. I'm out on the Olympic Peninsula, uh, pretty pretty far from everything really, uh, surrounded by the Olympic National uh, Park and the mountains and quite beautiful out here. And uh, I started doing more and more online stuff. And boy, am I glad I did it, you know, with the, with the shutdowns and I mean, travel would have been horrible i mean could you imagine being trapped in a hotel in some foreign country not able to travel i mean i, I read about some poor british couple and this happened to and they just went through their life saving <laughs> staying at this hotel maybe you read about the same article but uh a lot of people ended up getting trapped so thank goodness for this guy who mm -hmm. i listened to over the years and um i started doing more and more online developing uh I never had heard of Zoom or any of this stuff, you know. Uh, I, I'm very non-technical. I'm not savvy at all. But here I am, you know, getting close to 70 years old and making a living online with Zoom and you know, online personal training. So it went from in the gym every day to traveling and teaching to pretty much in one spot working online. That's sort of the progression of the last 20 years. Is it a big shock to suddenly to go from that nomadic lifestyle to suddenly being rooted to one place? No, actually, it was uh, surprisingly pretty easy. You know, uh, I really like my little tiny house. Uh, I feel, you know, uh, very cozy, very comfortable. I have everything I need. And uh, I kind of travel now through the Internet and so forth. And I, I pretty much do all my work on an iPad. And the online personal training has been very good for me. And I kind of um, get a chance to meet people all over the world still, almost like traveling. But now I travel through the Internet. Mm -hmm. I, for example, I, I trained a girl in her living room yesterday uh, from Portugal. And the day before, I trained a guy from Mumbai, India. And like a week ago, I tra uh, trained a guy in Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, so I mean, the world is a very small place. So the yeah, the online has worked out well for me. Are there are and there any are there any plans to get back to to traveling? Obviously, when you know, when, when whenever all this is over, whenever that is next next year or so, um, are there any plans to to get back out there or? Are you, are you well, right now, it doesn't look like the lockdowns are going to be ending anytime soon. And uh, I, um, so we'll see. Uh, I, I can't say there's no plans, uh, but for sure, there's a couple of places I'd like to go to. I'd like to get back to Icaria, Greece. Uh, I think I'd like to go to uh, Lisbos, Portugal, where this, uh, uh, this woman lives. 
that I trained yesterday. I've never been to Portugal. There's one of the few places. And apparently it's just absolutely gorgeous there. Mm. And I love the ocean. I'm, I'm very close to the uh, sea here, but it's, it's, you know, it's very chilly and cold here <laughs> in the Olympic Peninsula. It's, it's similar to, uh, similar client to Ireland or Scotland, you know. Mm. It's not the kind of place you go for a day, <laughs> day in the beach, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean you could, you could, but <laughs> so are you up near? Are you, are you up near Seattle? Are you, Steve? Am I in the right kind of area? Are you? Are you yeah, up... yeah, yeah. Just a little higher, but over west, mm. right on the Puget Sound, and then Canada is just above it. We're okay. here, and Vancouver Islands here, and then Vancouver, British Columbia, and Canada. So we're right on that. You know, about about the same. Uh, what is it? The uh, that's same latitude. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same latitude as, uh, as Scotland, Ireland, you know, mm. a little below Iceland, a little above Scotland, mm. Ireland. Yeah. I spent some time on um, Vancouver Island. It's beautiful up there, isn't it? And, uh, oh, absolutely I gorgeous. Swim, but yeah, it's, it's, it's cold. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh... Victoria is just a beautiful, beautiful little city. Yeah. So we're not too far from there. Very Would you cool. say, though, <laughs> The the, 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 the the years of traveling, in a way, set you up very well to be able to train people in during this pandemic because, you know, people didn't have access to gyms. People didn't have access to all these things. And you've you maintained your physique and made made progress constantly training in, in hotel rooms. I've got your e, you've got an ebook which is about isometrics and you take people through a series of different exercises that are quite well suited to a hotel room because that's i think where you were when you perhaps were, were videoing it was or actually in croatia <laughs> <laughs> there we go it so, was, so it, you it was a hotel, uh, this. on the coast yeah uh you're absolutely correct i've uh, i've been a minimalist by nature pretty much my whole life there was a there was a time span where i became a householder and had two kids and a gym and a jiu-jitsu school where i wasn't a minimalist but prior to that, I used to have a rule. If I can't fit it into my car and move in 20 minutes, I have too much stuff. Literally, that was, uh, that was a principle I lived by. And then, you know, got married and, you know, did the whole family thing. But afterwards, like I said, I, I moved into a camper van and I lived very happily in a Mercedes van, you know, that had been all tricked out and outfitted. So I'd already knew how to scale things down but being on the road i literally lived out of one bag um i just put all that knowledge to work all that minimalist knowledge that i had acquired over the years and yeah uh i i learned that less can be more sometimes and it's not so much the equipment it's the principles behind it's the principles of the exercise not the actual equipment itself so m m most of the things that I teach in the spouse could be used with barbells, could be used with uh, body weight, uh, dumbbells, machines, you know, doesn't matter. So, it's the principle. So how did you go about it? Because we had, um, we've had Dan John on a few times and he talks about de deprivation leads to innovation, I think he, he says. So... You know, and especially with gyms being shut, I know I put some stuff out and somebody commented on it and said, gyms are shut, mate, come back and motivate me when they, when they open up. And I was like, who knows? I mean, they're open now, but like back then, it was like, who knows when that's going to be? You can't wait until they open up to get, to get, like, to carry on doing what you're doing. So I was doing stuff at home. These guys were doing stuff at home. So how did you... Like what? What kind of new stuff did you did you think of? Like using the principles of strength and mobility and movement and stability and all of that. What kind of you know? How did you? How did it evolve over that over that time? Over that fifteen years? Say? Well, it's, it's it's really funny because there were different times in my life where uh, where I, for example, I owned a very very nice gym in Center City, Philadelphia. And it had all sorts of equipment. It had Nautilus, it had hammer strength, dumbbells, barbells, um, everything you can imagine, kettlebells, club bells, very well equipped. But I found myself so busy working people out that I'd be exhausted. I just wanted to go home. And then I go home and I think, damn, I, would, I wish I would have worked out. <laughs> so, you know, I used to work myself out of my living room or my backyard. 
And, you know, all you need is a horizontal bar. And a lot of times, just because I had to just kind of recruit my own energy, and my day used to start around 5, 5.30, you know, and I usually get done early in the afternoon, and then I greet the kids when they came home from school. I, I just worked out of my own living room right at home. So I've been, even though I had the gym, I've been doing this for a long time and just enjoyed the privacy. I, uh, to tell the guys that the truth, I don't like them. I really don't. Uh, they're loud. They're noisy. I hate the music. You know, it's not conducive to training. Uh, people just doing all sorts of silly stuff, you know, uh, attention whores, you know, <laughs> look at me, look at me, you know, um, the girl taking selfies of her ass while she's on the step mill and just goofy stuff like that. Yeah. So I, I just found it very tranquil and able to concentrate a lot, a lot better at home. And so, it's, you know, I had, I had very minimalist equipment at home, you know, a few kettlebells. I, I built a pull-up bar and um, you don't need much. Mm. And uh, it's not the equipment. It's, it's not the equipment. It's funny what you say about that because I, I was, I'm, I'm like that as well. I do stuff outside um, I train guys outside in a local park using kettlebells, maces, pull-up bars, stuff like that. And I was like that in a gym. And you see, and there's just distraction everywhere. And if you're, under a heavy, if you're under a heavy weight, the last thing you want to be is distracted halfway through a, a rep or a set because lots can go wrong. Um, so yeah, Sometimes so lots doesn't happen. People just sit there on their yeah, phone. Yeah, that's one of the things I think I think it's kind of, you know, the people people because I've had people come to me and they're like, can you just give me a routine to do just so I don't have to think and I can get on with it? And I'm like, no, if you focus and actually think about what you're doing and think about a program, I was speaking about this the other day, then you get, you know, you get the result that you want. And it only it can only take half an hour a day as long as you've got a half an hour's focus. You know. So it doesn't take if you're training properly. Exactly. And that's one of the myths of exercise that you need to train hours. A lot of people won't even start because they believe that if they don't, you know, if they can't give it like an hour or two a day, then they might as well not even try. But in truth, modern exercise science has shown that even as little as one strength workout a week can be very productive. Yeah. There was a fellow by the name of Dr. Uh, Doug McGuff that wrote Body by Science. And he has what he calls the big five. And he, they, they produce stellar results in people with just one simple workout a week of five exercises. Now, no one's saying that's ideal. But what they are saying is, hey, it's still very productive. And there's no one on the planet that can say they don't have time for at least one workout a week. Well, if they do, they, they can't manage their time. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I, my, my programs is a minimum twice a week that people work with us just because then we've got that touch base and we try and make that non-negotiable. But I have people turn to me and say, well, that, that's not value for money. And you're like, well, if I tell you I can get you the same result for, for 20 workouts a month versus eight work, workouts a month, which is better value? The one that's going to take you less time. You know? <laughs> I could make Absolutely. it harder for you. <laughs> and, and it's been proven. It has been decisively proven. <clears throat> There's no real difference between working out one, two, three, four, or even five times a week. Results are not commensurate with the amount of time spent. What results are commensurate with is the intensity of effort, how hard you work. So if you have someone that really trains really, really hard, even once a week, they would get better results than if they just dilly-dally like four or five workouts a week. Yeah. So how do you measure for you? How did you measure intensity then when you were you suddenly create this minimalist approach? Because a lot of clients, for example, have so many weaknesses in wrists and joints and things like that. What did you do to overcome that skill barrier that's often needs to be overcome with body weight? How did you well, make that accessible? I had, I had to do a whole scaling process uh, of making the exercises easier. Let's take an exercise that is very difficult for the average person. Let's talk about the pull-up or the chin-up, either one, where you're lifting your body weight off the floor, you know, using the strength of your arms and upper back. Most people cannot do that. You know, we take it for granted, you know, because we're in the business. But if we were to go all over the United States and all over Britain 
we would find that the vast majority of people could not pull their own weight up over a horizontal bar. So what to do? It's not like you have a nice posh lat machine or something, right? So I found that doing leg assisted chin-ups worked out very well, where people would use their legs to help uh, use, using uh, suspension straps. And then soon that became too easy. So then I figured, well, what if we were to just support the leg, but not use the leg? So that would be the second step, leg supported chin-ups. Then the third step might be they built to the point where maybe they can do one, but that's all. One is this all out. So you do a rest pause where you, you pull yourself up and then you rest, recuperate a little bit in another one. And eventually you cut the time down between each rep to where they're doing a standard set. And then if they have a lot of potential and they're pretty strong, then you have to make it even harder for the really strong person. Usually you, usually you never get to that point, you know, a straight set, but uh, you might start to play with the range of motion, like easier range versus harder range, like that. That was the progression they came up with. That's like it. it's just leg supported, uh, um, uh, maybe negative emphasized for some people. But I mean, that, that's just one example. So that even my grandmother could get a pull-up workout. I, I've actually have an 83-year-old woman that I'm working with now who does leg-assisted uh, pull-ups and chin-ups. Mm. And then for people that absolutely uh, have serious arthritic problems and joint problems, you can always swap out isometrics for uh, an exercise where dynamic movement is too painful or problematic for the joints. So there's always a way. And as far as intensity, uh, I, I encourage people to go to a momentary muscular failure or momentary muscular fatigue. I think that's the only way you can really tell whether you've actually produced a bona fide training effect. We know that you don't need to go to momentary muscular failure. Science has shown that it's not necessary, but how do you know if you've produced a training effect? Mm. You don't, mm. but if you, if you fatigue the muscle so thoroughly, you cannot do another repetition in good form, then for sure, you know that you've, you've done everything you can to, to produce that training effect. Mm. And, uh, you know, the whole training to failure thing kind of got a bad rap there for a while, Pavel and all the guys. But see, they made the mistake of thinking and using the old Soviet weightlifting method. Everything's geared towards the 1980s Soviet weightlifting techniques. That's Dragon Door and then Major Strong first. And they, uh, Pavel even talks about it in his, um, on, on the forum. But Soviet weightlifting method is not necessarily a good way to train for jujitsu. It's not necessarily a good way to train for a 10K race. It's not necessarily a good way to train for life. It's good for if you want to be a weightlifter. And if lifting a heavy weight is important, that's the way to go. And there you wouldn't want to go to failure because you got to practice the, the lift as a skill. So there's a lot of confusion between you know weightlifting and weight training or strength training versus weightlifting. Modern science has shown us that you don't you, the heavy weight isn't even necessary if you know how to use it properly. So would you say one so, of your principles was specific, specificity? I can't even say it now. Specificity. Yeah. Specificity. specificity. Yeah. yeah, that's one. Can you the, say it for me, James? Specificity. That's the one. Yeah. You're only good at what you do, mm. basically. Yeah, you know, you're only good at what you train for. And have you found, so, Steve, Steve, that you've obviously, you know, how many how many decades have you been sort of training seriously now? Five five decades, something like that. Well, I started in 1964. Let's right. Count. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Wow. And, and you're obviously still, um, you know, in incredible shape now. But you've, I think. Uh, You've, you've trained consistently, you know, since the 1960s. Um, so have you found that as you, as you know, as time has gone on, have you adapted the way that you personally train or because you train so consistently and have done for so long, you can 
you know, obviously maybe you're not the same as you, you were in your 20s and 30s, but are you able to almost replicate what you've been doing through the whole of your, your life and career at the moment? Well, I've changed a lot of things. You know, I, I started out with uh, the old York barbell system. Uh, York, Pennsylvania was the mecca of uh, weight training knowledge back in the 50s and 60s. And uh, some of those old York courses are actually pretty good. And then I did a lot of the, you know, the, the, the training schemes of the day. For example, maybe you heard of a fellow by the name of Reg Park mm -hmm. from South Africa, very famous strongman bodybuilder. And Reg was the one that invented the five by five system. Mm -hmm. And then perhaps you heard of the 20 rep squat program. You know, these were some things I did as, as a young man coming up. And I had very good results from those type of training protocols. That's just two that come up, but there's other ones too. And I, 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 uh, I got very intrigued by a guy by the name of Stuart McRobert, um, who wrote The Hard Gainer. I wasn't necessarily a hard gainer. And all, all the while I was competing in wrestling and then later judo and jujitsu. So I was always looking for ways to improve myself in those sports. So the weight training always had a, a, a reason for being. I wasn't weightlifting or weight training for itself or for its own sake. Although, you know, like a lot of young guys, I had an ego and I like to show off big lifts and so forth, you know. But for the most part, my primary purpose was condition myself to play my sport better and safer. And then right about 1970, I read about Arthur Jones and the new high intensity training principles. And I got really intrigued. And uh, around 72, I, I, I got to a Nautilus gym and tried out these newfangled machines, fell in love with them and stayed with that for the next couple of decades, pretty much high intensity training protocols. But then like a lot of things, started getting bored, started looking at other things. That's when I got on board with the kettlebell and club bells right about the same time, looking at that. But in retrospect, I see that as a mistake now. I think the kettlebells were a mistake. Uh, I, I think they're very hard in the joints. And I, I, I think that they can cause a lot of osteoarthritis. And I found that uh, I was damaging myself. And it's really funny because my ex-wife, uh, DC Maxwell, she was the third woman in America to get a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And she was on the cover of Pavel's first women's kettlebell book from Russia with Tough Love. Maybe you remember that book. She was the pretty blonde on there. But she had said to me very early, she said, hey, you know what? What would it be a kick in the pants if 10 years from now we find out that this stuff is really bad for us? And I said, shut up. You know, I don't want to hear it. Sure enough, she's had to have a hip replacement surgery. Mm. And what do, you, what do you put that down to? Is it a specific sort of exercise or specific sort of protocols that you were using? Uh... It's, it's the wear and tear, wear and tear. Doing high, fast, high velocity, explosive movements. There's a myth in the exercise community that that selectively recruits fast twitch muscle fibers. That is not true. That's patently false. If you look at the literature and you study it closely, you recruit all the muscle fiber, including the fast twitch muscle fiber, just doing an isometric, not even moving. You do not need to move fast to be fast. You do not need to do exploding, clapping push-ups to improve your punch. Moving a heavy weight fast is a very specific skill. You know, we were talking about specificity. It does not enhance other skills. Trying to duplicate sports skills in the weight room is a big mistake. And what I found was the explosive swings and the snatches and the cleans were particularly damaging to the body. And I could name a whole litany of popular trainers that have completely damaged their body from doing this type of lifting and so forth. And it's a mistake. You know, the hip replacements, the knee surgeries, the back surgeries and all that uh, has all been a result of this type of damaging lifting. And I was a big proponent for a while because it's fun and I did enjoy it. But I also realized that uh, it, was, it was probably doing more harm than good. And so I almost did a complete reverse and went back to some things I'd worked on earlier. 
By the way, in the 60s, isometrics were hugely popular. I don't know whether you know, um, well, you, you've heard of the great Bruce Lee, mm. big proponent of uh, not only isometrics, but machine training. Interesting enough, you know, people always say machines are non functional. That's silly. A lot of the so called functional training, like smacking a, a tire with a sledgehammer, that's the most dysfunctional thing you could do. Why would you do something like that when, you know, there's much better, more efficient ways to work your musculature without damaging the body? Mm. You know, it's one thing if you have to go out and work all day in a, a road crew, but, you know, why would you voluntarily go and do that? It doesn't make sense. It's a very inefficient way to load the, the body. No one muscle group is really getting a, an effective load. And at the end of the day, what have you really done other than just make yourself tired? Mm. So yeah, this, I've, I've read, um, oh, sorry, go on, go on, Paul. I was about to say, because this, I mean, this is, this is really interesting to hear, but it puts you in opposition with a vast swathe of strength and conditioning coaches and other people in, in the same industry and obviously people that, you've, that you work with and stuff like that. So, so where do you see the role of, of the kind of the tools, the tools, the kettlebell, the barbell? The, the whatever you're going to be using what, what is that role is that is that do you see that as a sport or do you see it as a tool for fitness uh, it's more of a sport kettlebells for sure you know it's kettlebell sport and so forth it's interesting because uh, besides jiu-jitsu i also am certified to teach russian sistema which is a russian military martial art and i traveled to russia eight times uh, ironically um kettlebells were not very popular at all it's just like this strange fringe we were all lied to. <laughs> it's not a Russian secret weapon at all. Uh, as to a Russian military academy in Krasnodar, uh, uh, training in Kadashnikov's Sistema. And it was like two rusty kettlebells over in the corner. And the guys were doing curls with them. Sistema <laughs> <laughs> is an interesting thing because you see mad things on YouTube with that. So I never... Yeah, well, the, the there trust there are Russians that are training with kettlebells, but it's not like hugely... But... For my, for my way of thinking now, I don't see any real reason to use kettlebells at all to tell the God's honest truth. I really don't. And I, I'll never use them again. And I can tell you the injuries that people have sustained. Pavel's had both elbows sur uh, surgery. He, you know, one, he was on the Joe Rogan show. And uh, Joe says, well, why do you only advocate two exercises? If you notice his last couple books only advocate two, that's because that's all he can do. <laughs> can't do anything because his elbows are all fucked up. You know? Dan, Dan John, I respect a lot. He's an interesting guy, but he, he's had double hip replacement surgery. Yeah, he has. Yeah. The CEO of Strong First, um, Brett Jones, has had nine knee surgeries. It's almost like he was bragging about it. I mean, I can go on and on with the back surgeries and knee surgeries and, and so forth. My ex-wife, DC Maxwell, hip replacement surgery. So far, thank God, I don't have any hip surgery but i'm loath to take advice from a guy that's had joint replacement surgery i'm not going to take strength and fitness advice from a guy like that you know now I mean, I'm, involved, you... I'm involved in a very dangerous sport myself yeah jiu-jitsu some people would question my sanity like i say i'm 68 years old and i still like to go out there in the mat and roll around i'm very careful but still how you know there's always that element of danger but see that's the difference between strength and strength training versus recreation. A lot of people blur the lines. There's a big difference between exercise versus recreation. Mm -hmm. I look at all these activities as recreation. And you got to pick and choose your recreation careful. Mm -hmm. For example, running, swimming, triathloning, uh, bicycling, skiing. These are not exercises. These are recreational pursuits. Kayaking, all that stuff. Jiu-jitsu. You know, and we need recreation. We do. But we shouldn't try to make our strength training into a recreation. And that's what kettlebells were for a lot of people. So what would you, what do you advocate? In, in, so this boils down to exactly what you're teaching your students at the moment. What exactly are you advocating to, um, to help them reach their goals, which is often they probably come to you as a, do they come to you as a strength coach or what do they come to you as? Uh, usually fat loss. <laughs> Okay. A lot of, yeah, I mean, the United States is leading the world in obesity. It's uh, pretty sad. Uh, and, and the rest of Europe is 
quickly catching up, unfortunately. I'm sure you see it in the UK, you know, mm -hmm. um, the obesity epidemic. So a lot of people are really struggling to maintain weight and weight control and so forth. But what I maintain, what, what I, now, it's not, once again, it's not so much the equipment, but it's the way you train. I'm very into uh, high tension, slow, controlled repetition over full range. And it doesn't matter whether you use your body weight. And uh, for a lot of people, uh, they've damaged themselves so much over the years that uh, I put them in an isometric program. Okay. And uh, a lot of people are, uh, that were stuck at home, they didn't really have much in the way of equipment. So that, that, that exercise philosophy lended itself really well to minimalist approach to exercise. So even if you don't have any equipment at all, you know, you can still give yourself a great workout in your own living room, uh, just using isometrics and body weight exercise. Done slow, controlled. So would you say the the if someone comes to you, and say they're just the average person, really what you're doing is you're just trying to create the most resilient, healthy individual. So someone who has good joint range of motion, someone who has resilient, tough uh, mus musculature, someone who has good posture, someone who has some kind of endurance and some kind of strength, but it's, it's kind of, it's human specific, but not necessarily recreational sports specific strength. That's correct. Um, there was a fellow by the name of Ken Hutchins that wrote a very important paper called recreation versus exercise. And it, it was probably one of the most important papers ever written because once again, there's this huge blurring of the lines, you know, for example, um, CrossFit, very popular, right? CrossFit is not exercise, it's recreation. It's a recreational sport. People compete in exercise. Um, I almost hate to say this, but my daughter is very good CrossFit. <laughs> she's incredibly strong. She's probably stronger than I am now, man. I mean, she's, she's lifting some amazing weights and uh, you know she does the CrossFit work and she loves it. That's her sport, that's her recreation. That's what she does. And we've had many conversations about this. And, you know, I, I've tried to warn her about, you know, some of the joint things to come because she's doing some very questionable type things, you know, with her body. But, yeah, there's a distinct difference between recreation versus exercise. But uh, go to seriousexercise.com and you can download the recreation versus exercise uh, paper and read it for yourself. It's, it's, it's really quite good. So if someone's, so get, so here's, here's one of the th interesting things from our, for our listeners who are generally not trainers. So one of the, one of the things they're going to be hearing is like, well, all I have access to are strength and conditioning coaches or CrossFits or, you know, PTs. Um, does that mean I'm going down the wrong route? So what, what advice would you give to someone who would be working with a more traditional strength and conditioning approach, what kind of principles could they apply to their process, given that they're probably not training with someone like yourself? What, what would be their route to, to maintain that joint health, et cetera? Well, probably the most important thing anyone can do is just slow down. Uh, once again, uh, uh, exercise science has proven beyond a shadow of a doubt, it's not the amount of mechanical work being performed. The amount of repetitions don't matter. It's the time under load that matters. Three 10 second reps would be absolutely as valuable as doing 20 faster reps. For example, uh, I was at a fairly well known gym in London. It was called the Commando Temple. Yeah. yeah. There was a young man in there that was really showing off. He had quite a nice physique. And of course, he had his shirt off, so everyone knew it. And uh, he jumped up on the pull-up bar and he knocked out 21 pull-ups. Pretty fast, about one second up, one second down. And, but that's impressive, you know. Um, I mean, 21 pull-ups, no matter how you do it, unless, of course, you're kipping. He didn't kip, but it was close. You know, one second up, one second down. But for the 20 reps he did, there was about 40 second time under low. So I instructed my client to get up because I was giving a, a, a PT session. And he did four seconds up, one second pause, four seconds down, taking care not to yank the joints, 
and uh, his elbows and his shoulders, keeping the elbows and uh, shoulders in the socket. And he ended up doing five, five reps, but each one was over 10 seconds. He actually had a greater time under load. He had close to a minute time under load versus the 40 seconds of the guy that did the 20 reps. Now, both styles of training will give you the same results. You still get the same hypertrophy and the same strength, whether you go slow, whether you go fast, but the slower is way safer and a lot less tra uh, traumatic to the joints. For that young fella that trained in that explosive fashion, he's creating micro trauma every single time he trains. Little insults to the body. He won't notice it for a while. It's like smoking, you know? I've known people that smoke for decades and they seem fine. And then one day they're diagnosed with emphysema or cancer. Well, it's the same thing with this type of training. You don't feel it. You feel pretty good. You know, you get all this feel good hormones and so forth. You, you know, you're, you're, you're all uh, janked up, you know, all fired up. But over time, you notice, man, my shoulders really bugging me. God, my back's so stiff. You get out of bed. Over time, the joint health begins to erode from all these micro traumas, micro insults. Not an acute injury, subacute injury. And that's why I have people slow down to prevent these subacute injuries. There's no reason to go faster unless you want to lift more weight or you want to do more reps. But we know that mechanical work doesn't matter. And a clever fellow can use a relatively light weight, even just body weight, and make it really, really hard. Because at the end of the day, all that matters is creating a deep level muscular fatigue. And that's what taps into the survival mechanism. Your body is saying, whoa, this task I've been given has produced this deep level fatigue and I wasn't up to the task. So I better take my valuable bodily resources and go towards making myself a little bit stronger. It's part of the survival mechanism. So each workout is basically tapping into your biologic survival mechanism. And it has nothing to do with the amount of weight or reps or anything else. I think it's, that's absolutely fantastic, Steve, because I think a lot of, I mean, there's always this, this thing around, around gyms and things anyway, isn't there, about specifically men really trying to lift more weight, more load uh, than they can safely to, to tap into this ego type thing. And, um, and, and so that's one of the first things is, you know, to lift what you can lift safely, but then to actually slow it right down as well, which, mean, which means you're going to have to deal with less load, aren't you, to do the exercise correctly and safely. Um, and it will make it a lot harder. So uh, it, it totally strips away that ego and, and, and uh, sounds like a really safe, uh, and, and we talk a lot on this show about longevity, you know, and people, we train people in their 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, so that's, that's a great piece of advice, I think, for everyone. Well, it's a bit, it's a bit like the, um, we spoke to Brad Kearns a few weeks. I don't know if you know Brad. Um, he's part of the, um, the uh, he works with Mark Sisson. Um, so he's part of the kind of paleo community, but he was an endurance athlete and he uh, utilizes a system called the 180 formula from Phil Maffetone. And really what that does is it just gives you some direct feedback on what your heart is telling you, which is go slower or I'm strong enough to, for you to go fast. And it gives you that feedback. And, it, and you can do that with a heart rate monitor. You can strap it on your wrist and it will beep when you hit a certain zone, you know? And for the 180, it's 180 minus your age. But when it comes to the variety of human movement, squats, deadlifts, push-ups, pull-ups, isometrics, handstands, you name it, they all seem to have a different level of intensity. And to try and learn that is, is very complex for people. And I suppose what we try and do, and what we're trying to do on this podcast is to, it goes back to what you said earlier, which is the principles. So have you ever done any thinking around sticking the principles into some kind of e easy to consume manner for your clients or do they just pick it up on the fly? Well, I mean, there's th things out there already um, that out outline the principles very well. Like I said, the bo book Body by Science. Excellent resource for people that uh, want to get started. Uh, Ken Hutchins wrote a lot of different uh, uh, manuals and, 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 and so forth. But I, I guess 
if you would do the exact opposite of what most people do in the gym, you'd probably be on the right track. <laughs> they, they explode and go really fast and you should slow down. The people walk around, um, you know, for long periods of rest between sets so they can lift more weight. You'd be better off going from exercise to exercise and very little rest. By the way, there's a lot of exciting um, research on uh, strength training's role in building heart health. Uh, up to now, uh, heart health has um, always been considered the domain of aerobic steady state exercise. But with the new research, they showed that strength training equally strengthens the heart, not with elevated heart rate. That's not necessarily an indicator of whether your heart is getting a workout. Uh, it was, uh, um, cardio perfusion is greatly increased during strength training because of a superior venous return. So with strength training, you're, you're getting a more efficient venous return. So the heart doesn't have to pump as fast, but it's pumping harder. So each beat, the ejection fraction, the amount of, uh, or stroke volume, the blood being pushed out of the heart is much greater per beat. So there is definitely heart friendly, heart healthy benefits to strength training. And if you pretty much go from exercise to exercise, with little or no rest, you are getting quite a good cardiovascular and cardiorespiratory workout as well. So for a lot of my people, they don't have time to do much more than maybe walk during the day. And uh, I can assure them that they're getting plenty of cardio benefit just from doing the slow, high intensity strength training. They don't need two separate workouts per se. We, we talk about that a lot on here actually. Um... You know, and saying to people, if you're going to the gym to burn calories by doing as many, like by running on the treadmill as far as far and fast as you can, or going on the rowing machine for however long, just to burn calories and get the cardio, just go for a walk instead outside in the fresh air and get some vitamin D and do some strength training instead, and you'll you'll still get the cardio benefit. Um, That's right. We, but, we uh, do, doing cardio for calorie burning is pretty much uh, a, an exercise in futility. <laughs> you burn really a, a very small amount of calories What's and that? you do not you do not raise the metabolism that's another myth no. the met yeah you cannot, yeah you're burning you're burning calories for four days afterwards and all of that it's like oh come on no um, no, no maybe an hour question you were talking about high intensity training that you were doing in the 70s yeah so what does what does so this brings me up because a lot of people will do high intensity training now because they go down the gym and they get the afterburn effect that they talk about and all of that don't they by doing all these exercises as fast as possible. So you've just said you can do exercise after exercise after exercise with people rest. What's the who? Sorry, someone right. just came in. <laughs> you can do. I was like, am I hearing things? You can do exercise after exercise with with minimal rest and you get the cardio benefit. But for people listening, that might mean, well, going to a hit class where you're doing, you know, loud music and bang, 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 do this and then do this and do that. Yeah, yeah. But no, see, I... There's two types of hit. There's yeah. eight I I T. Yeah. High intensity interval training. This is something I wouldn't recommend. Uh, there's no reason to do it. Uh, a lot of the, a lot, there's no doubt that it works, but there's no doubt that it also erodes joint health over, over, the, over time. The type of high intensity training I'm talking about is HIT or HIT, high intensity training. And for someone that is very much- For the for listeners. Well, the high intensity training is strength training, only strength training. And it's done with controlled, in a controlled scientific manner. No, no fast jerky movements. Um, the weight and repetitions are not the primary goal. They're only secondary goals. The primary goal of the training is muscular fatigue, yeah. producing deep level muscular fatigue. And so, for example, in a, uh, let's say a CrossFit class or weightlifting, I'm doing everything in my power to make the exercise easier because I want to lift more weight right? Or I want to do more reps. So I'm doing everything in my power to make the exercise uh, more efficient and easier. Whereas with the type of philosophy I'm talking about, I'm doing everything in my power to make it harder. 
Mm. Rather than looking for ways to make it easier, I'm looking for ways to make it much, much harder. That's why you don't need a real heavy weight. So there's now, things if, like- if, 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 if you want to lift a heavy weight, you got to practice heavy weight. Well, if you look back in the 19th century, you've got Eugene Sandow and Arthur Saxon talking about the light dumbbell system where they, they used isometrics and very light weights. They used a, you know, maybe three pound weights and would do very high repetitions back to back with minimal rest. And they would never go heavier than say like five kilos in total, which, um, so that the old masters had a very similar thinking if I'm correct. Well, unfortunately they, they almost went too far the other way with the, with the super light dumbbells and so forth. Um, I'm not talking about that so much. This is more like middle of the road. What? You know, you, you, gotta, you gotta use a weight that's heavy enough to tax your muscles and create fatigue somewhere between 30 seconds and a minute and 20 seconds, 120 seconds. So in other words, if the weight's so heavy, you can't get at least 30 seconds time out of the load, then you need to lighten it up. Mm -hmm. And once you're doing like 120 seconds or two minutes, uh, it weights way too light. And most people do better somewhere between 60 and 90 seconds. And your, your tolerance for time under load, that's something you almost have to experiment with. Some people do better with a shorter time under load. Some people do better with a higher time under load. And I want to be very clear, because there's going to be some people who got their feelings hurt from some of the things I said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm not saying it doesn't work. All these systems out there are working. The gymnastics systems are working. The in the hood systems are working. The kettlebells for sure work. There's no doubt about it. Powerlifting works, crossfit works, Olympic lifting works, it all works. But they're not all equally efficient in the time. They're not all equally safe. Everyone always talks about hypertrophy. Everyone always talks about uh, strength, but everyone's leaving out safety. Mm. You almost never hear guys because they're in their most instructors in their twenties and thirties. You know, some in their forties, but usually guys by the time they reach my age, they're definitely thinking safety because I can see the air of my waves. I can see, wow, probably wasn't such a great idea that I did that. You know. And at the end of the day, just because someone gets a certain result training a particular way, doesn't mean they couldn't have got the same or even better results training a different way and safer results training a different way. So, you know, there's a lot of people that have been ruined by their success. They have initial success with a particular system and they just stick with it come hell or high water even to their own detriment. Can I ask you, Steve, um, about, because obviously you said a lot of clients will come to you with, uh, like, like for most of us, I think, with say fat loss goals and things like that. And what what do you do? I know you've got, you. we haven't really talked about it today, but you have a very, we've mentioned it, but you have this sort of minimalist approach to, to kind of life in general and not just training. Um, uh, but this sort of non-attachment to things and, you know, keeping material things very, very, very low and, and that sort of thing. What do you do in terms of, um, or what would you advise and what do you do yourself in terms of diet and eating? I'd imagine you keep things very simple in that, in that respect as well, do you? Uh, I do. Uh, th there's like this huge uh, idea that you need to gouge yourself with protein. <laughs> it's simply not true. And, you know, carbohydrate became the bad boy of nutrition. It's funny because when, um, when I was coming up in the 60s and 70s, fat was the bad boy of nutrition. Then it kind of turned and now, you know, the, the carbohydrate. Uh, carbohydrates are uh, protein sparing. So if, if you have a diet rich in carbohydrate, your protein is spared to do exactly what it needs, growth and repair. I follow the advice of a... Uh, of uh, Dr. John Tilden, who was a turn of the century American physician who treated disease through natural means. And uh, it's really funny because he really railed against the overuse of, of um, drugs and vaccines and all this kind of stuff. And this was more than a hundred years ago. 
And uh, but he thought it was going to get better, but uh, I can see it's just gotten much, much worse. And um, he he was uh, very much into improving digestion. Just because you eat it doesn't mean you can digest it. And if you overload your body with uh, what he called crowded nutrition, it makes the di uh, the digestion very inefficient. So there's a real tendency to overeat in situations like that because this food isn't digested and it's not giving the sanity levels and it's not providing people with the nutrients they need. So basically, uh, I simp it's a, simp a simplified meal plan. For example, I'll usually have three meals a day. Uh, one's a fruit-based meal when fruit's in season. One's a protein-based meal. And I, I couple that with um, a large raw vegetable salad. And then there's a carbohydrate-rich meal or a starch-rich uh, meal. And that could also be had with vegetables. And you can intersperse. You can have the protein in the morning or the, you know, the fruit at night or whatever. And oftentimes, I'll even just eat two meals a day. Two meals a day. And so you're just having, I mean, you're just eating to hunger. So if you're really hungry, you'll just eat more on the plate. If you're feeling yeah, just pretty on the plate. Yeah. And it's amazing when you start to uh, combine the foods and make the, the, the food very, uh, make the meals very simple, your digestion improves a lot. You really, really get a, a, a very efficient digestion. And you'll find yourself just eating less and less. You just don't really need to eat that much. And, and I know it hasn't you affected your training or anything like that, or your clients' training. You just find no, no, not at all. Uh, many people, uh, to tell the truth, the first thing I, I get people to do is stop drinking. Uh, I, I have a, uh, this one woman I'm working with, uh, just not drinking for two weeks, she lost almost four kilos. <laughs> That's the only thing she changed. Yeah. You know, alcohol really shuts down your fat burning mechanism, it makes it very hard to lose fat. Even one beer or one glass of wine will make it almost impossible for your body to uh, access its own stored, um, stored fat. Uh, a lot of people don't even know how fat, or what happens to fat. Your, your fat is metabolized and breathed out your lungs as CO2, mm -hmm. converted yeah. to carbon dioxide. That was something that was uh, just kind of like a, a, a recent finding. And going out and jumping around and running marathons on this stuff, it's not really going to help. It's just going to increase your appetite, make you really ravenously hungry. So I, I, other than uh, uh, walking, I, I don't advocate people do a, a lot of running and all this kind of stuff. Now, if people like it, if they enjoy it, yeah, do it as a recreational pursuit. But don't think you have to do it for health or longevity mm -hmm. or anything like that. And I mean, if you look at the oldest people in the world, in the blue zones, they're not running marathons, you know, they're not doing all this crazy stuff, you know, most of them are doing pretty moderate activity most of the day. It's but all of them, all of them could benefit from doing some strength training. Mm. No I was just going to say, Steve, that's really interesting because a lot of the things that you, you know, if you're having a, a meal that's predominantly fruit and you're having a meal uh, that's maybe, I think you said protein with like a raw vegetable salad or something, um, most of the food that you're eating is in its in its in its natural state isn't it or very very near to its natural state without demanding much preparation and much cooking and, and all that sort of thing so it's the, the preparation time for these things is very low as well and you're really in you know getting maximum sort of nutrition um and convenience from from that food and it also tastes a lot better in its natural state as well absolutely like for, i'll give an example uh yesterday for breakfast I had uh, Laird's uh, coffee. It has MCT. It's just a simple uh, Arabic coffee, uh, organic. And it's probably about 150 calories. And then I took uh, two tablespoons of lipo C, which is a very, very uh, good for the immune system. Um, it's about 90 calories per uh, tablespoon. I had two tablespoons. So that's a meal. It's a light meal, mm. but it's a meal. And then I went out and uh, I went to the local jiu-jitsu school and I rolled with one of the young guys there for almost an hour. And uh, I can still put a whooping on these young boys. <laughs> and then I, uh, I came back and I had uh, lamb. And I had that with a large raw vegetable salad and some steamed broccoli. 
And, you know, it was about five hours between each feeding. And then later uh, last night, uh, about five o'clock, I had uh, a bowl of quinoa with a few pine nuts in there. And I sweetened it up uh, with a little uh, date sugar. Just, you know, just a little, give it a little sweet taste. And it was delicious. That was it. That was the meal for the day. Mm. And uh, besides doing the jujitsu yesterday, I also went out and uh, walked about three miles at a nice pace, doing systemic breathing exercises, some breath holding drills. And of course, every day I do mobility drills. I've just recently got into cane fighting, you know, using a walking stick, you know, like Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so I take my cane out and I practice. I, think way, I, saw, I saw a photo of you um, walking out of the door, I think, with a walking stick, and I didn't know what yeah, it was about. You know, I said, do, uh, do, um, do you ever do a Willy Wonka? You know, when he walks out with his walking stick, Gene Wilder, and then have you seen that film? And then, like, it sticks, and he's like, oh no. And like, someone <laughs> like you could look like you might need a stick, but then you're like, actually, I can move. Look. <laughs> oh, that's funny. But, that's but, uh, but uh, an interesting note about the cane, by the way. Uh, TSA, the uh, security people cannot take your cane when you fly because it's a medical instrument. So whereas you can never fly with uh, any kind of other weapon, certainly no bladed, no, you know, anything like that, uh, you know, stun gun or, uh, you know, pepper spray, uh, any kind of firearm or knife or bladed instrument. But a walking stick is perfectly legal because it's a medical instrument. As long, as long as it doesn't have metal on it. If it's wood, you're good. So no sword in it then? <laughs> no <laughs> sword. <laughs> that's, that's all, that's all um, academic anyway, because you can't fly anywhere at the minute, can you? So. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, in the States, uh, you, you know, I, I, I flew to uh, South Carolina and uh, stayed there for a couple months. And but, uh, some, some states are more open than others. Some states don't even mandate masks. Yeah, well, we're coming out of our kind of restrictions. We're in the process of easing. So gyms are starting to open. People are starting to mix a little bit more. Um, so, you know, we'll see how the world looks in a few months. Um, but one of the things I wanted to bring up, and I'm aware of time because we don't want to keep you all day because you've got things to do. But um, my wife uh, broke her arm uh, a year ago, just around about here. So just at the top of the arm. And it's quite a bad break. So lots of pins and, and, and everything. But um, we were, I'd listened to you on, on Joe Rogan, actually, and you talked about hanging as a form of therapy. And uh, you know what? She had pretty crazy results of just hanging because one of the things that she was, she, she's got a great posture. She used to do a lot of ballet when she was a kid. So she's always had really good posture and a good movement in her arms uh, and her shoulders, sorry. But, but she was fearful that she was going to lose it. And actually hanging both in pronated and supinated position seemed to just have a, a, a radical effect on her healing and the increase in mobility. And it's certainly something that I'm always tell, telling my clients about. Uh, so where did you hear about that, that system? Uh, that there was a fellow by the name of Dr. John Kirsch. He wrote a book called Shoulder Pain, Its Solution and Prevention. He was an orthopedic surgeon and you know, surgeons make their living operating on people. So if you go to an orthopedic man for advice about an injury, of course, he's going to immediately say surgery. You know, that's what the medical community does. They either can operate on you with surgery or give you drugs, but there's no preventative of anything. You know, they don't have any answers to prevention or holistic health. But Kirsch um, started to experiment. I, I'm not sure exactly how he first came up with the idea, but he started uh, getting people to hang by their hands as a rehabilitation tool. And he found that the brachial hang, the overhand hang, palms facing away, uh, hand shoulder width, actually worked better for getting rid of shoulder pain than the surgery. A lot of the surgical patients would come back with complications later. And he got to the point where he was having such success, he, he refused to do sh shoulder surgery anymore. That was it. He wouldn't do it. And he just started putting everyone on hanging programs. And he did a landmark study at a retirement home with elders in their 80s in Kauai, 
uh, Kauai is one of the Hawaiian islands. And there's like, uh, what, Hawaii, Oahu, Kauai, Lana. It's one of the main chain. And uh, with stellar results. And after reading his book, I started hanging. And I have a little bar right here in my tiny house that I put up on my sleeping loft. And I hang every day. And I've had many of my athletes and online personal training uh, people that I coach start to hang as part of the daily regimen. And it really has profound effect. And just like your wife found out, it, it really works amazingly well. It's, it's quite painful if you have certain shoulder ailments, but eventually that pain goes away to the point where you have pain-free range of motion. And again, it's about scaling it, isn't it? It's not about jumping on there and hanging up for as long as you can. It's about no, just slipping away. Some people I have, they keep their feet on the floor. I lower the, you know, the bar down or we use two straps and they, they only do partially weighted hangs in the beginning. And over time, they build up more and more and more and more. So eventually, you know, the shoulder socket just opens right up. It creates room in the shoulder socket for the, the humerus to move around. The coracoid bone, and in the book, Shoulder Pain is Solution and Prevent, you can buy it on Amazon and read it off your iPhone. It's a very easy read. It's not too scientific. But he shows x-ray after x-ray, MRI after MRI, pictures in the book, um, evidence of how well the hanging works for getting rid of shoulder problems. And if you hang um, uh, prophylactically as a preventative, uh, you know, you, you'll never have shoulder problems for the most part. You know, unless, you know, you would fall off your mountain bike or something. <laughs> but I mean, for, for the most part, if you just hang as, as a preventative treatment, just at the end of each workout. And uh, hanging by your hands is an awesome grip workout too. Amazing grip workout. If you can work, if the average person can work up to two minutes, they have an incredibly strong grip. And there's a very high correlation between longevity and grip strength, by the way. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. I love, I love, I love getting people to do hanging because you say, right, how long? You ask them first, how long do you think you'll be able to hang off there for? And they go, I don't know, like a minute or so? Maybe? Is that too, like, is, is that long enough? And then they hang for about 15 seconds and they kind of they start to slip <laughs> off the bar. And they're like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. And it's like, exactly. It's a big deal. Yeah. So hanging, uh, I use this, like, one of my featured exercises in every routine, you know. And so you and have this body weight certification at the moment, don't you? Yeah, I do. Uh, I created it. Uh, this, I, I, people were stuck at home. No way to work out. Uh, I really do like isometrics, but many people find isometrics quite boring. <laughs> or they just want something else to do along with isometrics. And I must admit, isometrics are not uh, very sexy, you know. <laughs> but they do work. But people do like to do. The, people like to move. Psychologically, people like to move. But they got to move in a way that is safe and the vast majority of people out there especially in the states are quite overweight and their body weight is just too heavy they can't do a proper press up they, they have no chance of doing a, a pull up or a chin up just no way uh for a lot of people they're so immobile they can't do a body weight squat properly without coming on their toes or leaning the torso forward or they just simply can't get down so I needed a way to scale the exercises. So I created like an eight step way that you could take your mother or your grandmother and train them or an awkward, you know, teenager who's been playing video games, you know, all their life. And you could take any, anybody like this or even uh, to rehabilitate somebody from an accident or post-surgery or whatever. You can, uh, with the program, you can you can scale these exercises from an absolute uh, weakling beginner to uh, an Olympic caliber athlete. There's all a whole range, even within the same exercise, even within press up. You know, you can do elevated press, mm -hmm. you know, and then a ve very gradually move the the height of the either platform or, you know, I like to use a bar and a uh, a power rack, but it could be pieces of furniture. You know, maybe you're doing it on the dining room table. And then maybe the next time, you know, you get strong enough, you, you, you use in the living room couch or whatever, you know, over time, you know, over weeks and months. 
to eventually do a press up done the four. Well, when I was, I mean, I've spent the last year running my business online uh, and, and offering classes through Zoom. And sometimes people just have no equipment. You know, if you're lucky, people have got like a bag of rice or a bottle of water or someone's got a small kettlebell or something. So everything has been um, body weight. But one of the big limits I noticed at the beginning was people's joints, which I don't get as much, you know, feet. I don't get as much kind of ailments coming, uh, you know, into classes because people's wrists have started to condition. They've worked on those early progressions. They've managed to push themselves without injury and they keep showing up week after week after week. And it's been a great leveler, actually, because there's always it's been very creative for me as a trainer, because I, I started doing the Zoom classes thinking this is not what I'm into. This is not why I'm doing training. And I was quite annoyed because it didn't, you know, it interrupted everything, you know, this pandemic. Uh, but by the end of it, I've come to really, really enjoy it. And I enjoy the process of coming up with classes now and how I can be inventive with clients and seeing their kind of skill levels just slowly and incrementally increase. Yeah, I, I find the same. I was quite intimidated by Zoom and the whole internet thing. I mean, I always, I was always doing online training, but mostly through emails, you know. But I mean, how much can you really do through email? I, I, I did produce good results, but still, it's nothing like watching and seeing or being able to demonstrate. So Zoom has been a revolution for me. And I think a lot of people are not going to go back to the gym. I think Zoom is here to stay. I really do. And I think these online classes are probably the wave of the future. People really like being able to work in the privacy of their own living rooms and their own bedrooms and their own homes. Yeah. And yeah, Steve, it's, it's going to stick for me. And Steve, where do people go to access the, uh, the body weight course that you've, that you've got that they can, they can access that and buy that now? Where would they go for that? Um, I think, did, did Teresa send you the links for this? I think yeah, we'll, she we'll, yes, she did actually. I've, I've oh, okay. got those. Yeah, just shoot them over to me. Cool. Yeah, we'll put we'll put the links for that into the show notes and things so people can access the uh, and click straight through to the uh, to the body weight course. That sounds fantastic. That sounds sounds really really great. So well, so it, what it, I would... it enables the trainer to take almost any level. And I mean, I can remember before I came up with these progressions, like uh, and I didn't invent it. I mean, there, there's a fellow by the name of Drew Bay that came up with a lot of these ideas. I, I just kind of expanded on some of his stuff. But I was always frustrated because, I mean, trying to get a person to do a proper press-up is not an easy thing if they haven't been training for a long time. I mean, you know, claps neck, claps lower back, uh, shoulder blades, uh, you know, sticking way out. Uh, it's just really hard. But, you know, the, these progressions make it much easier for the professional trainer or just even the lay person that just wants to find a way that they can exercise themselves in a safe so, way. That's a, I think that's a brilliant place to maybe end this on because I, I think that just encapsulates everything that really that, that podcast the podcast is about, which is is like that you can do this safely, you can do this sustainably, and we all want to be having these conversations when we're in our sixties, seventies, and eighties beyond that we can still train, we still perform. You know, and be obviously be aware of the mileage that we've acquired over the years, but have a way of being the best we can at any point, because a lot of people get in touch with us saying, I want to be the best I can at this age or this age or this age. And I think what you show quite clearly is there is a roadmap to it. You've just got to educate yourself. And I get a sense that education is at the forefront of what you teach. Well, one of my early mentors said something, and we'll, we can end on this. Um, I, I can he said, look, anyone can be something really amazing at 20, 30, or even their 40s, you know? Uh, anyone can. But you don't see too many people that are amazing at 70 or 80 or 90. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to be that latter group. I'd like to be that person in his 80s and 90s that is still pretty amazing. <laughs> and so I had that long-range goal, you know? I'm looking at the long... The, the big picture, you know, I'm playing the long game. <laughs> now, a, a lot of these YouTube wonders are going to be completely burnt out by the time they're in the 40s, late 40s. They're going to find out everything I'm saying is true. You know, it's hard, though, when you're young and you're full of piss and vinegar and, you know, and you, <laughs> you, yeah. you your, dad, uh, your dad's always like, he tells you and you're like, no, no, you don't know what you're talking about. I know what I'm talking. And then you get to hit your dad's age and you're like, 
Oh, he was right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was right, man. You know, my, my father served in World War II in uh, the U.S. Navy. And uh, I was watching uh, the this television show called The Pacific. Maybe you've heard of it. It's a 10-part miniseries about the U.S. Marine Corps in the Battle of Guadalcanal. Well, yes. my, my, father, my father's part of that naval operation, and uh, it was pretty bad. I mean, the Japanese took a huge toll on the uh, U.S. in those battles. I mean, both sides, just horrific, horrific uh, casualties. But uh, he was there, and I was thinking, my God, these people were tough back then. I mean, mm-hmm. I can't even imagine, you know, going on to like a beach and just having machine gun uh, unbl- like Normandy, you know, like Saving Private Ryan. I mean, you look at these guys and you think, wow, that was some really, really tough people back in the day, man. You know, uh, I don't know what's happened to this modern age, but we're, we're sure not like that generation for sure. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. And I think you're, you're well on your way to uh, certainly being incredible in your, you know, 80s and 90s so uh yeah that's uh it's well, great... <laughs> well that's why we got you on because we're just we just we just think the stuff you do just you know you wouldn't be here doing it now if it hadn't worked yeah well for sure and you know there's a learning process in there too and you know at every step of the way the stuff would work but some with more risk than others you know so I'm not, I'm not saying this stuff doesn't work, but just because it works doesn't mean it's the best. And you've managed to achieve it while someone's tried to wrestle you to the ground and break your arm. <laughs> yeah, which yeah. doesn't happen fact, to me in my general life. In fact, I have to shove off. I, I have a young guy waiting to break my arm right now. So. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> Thank you so much, Steve. It was an absolute pleasure to, uh, to meet you and to, uh, to speak to you today. Good talking to you guys too. Thanks for having me on the show. And Hopefully we'll see each other again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers, Dave. Have a good day now. Cheers. So that about wraps up the show. Thanks to everyone for listening. We've been Health Oddity. My name's Paul. I'm with Peter and James. Is there anything you want to say, guys? Just that was quite incredible, wasn't it? Kind of, uh, you know, he said a lot of things there that give a lot of people, uh, well, so all of us probably something to think about. And I've got a big list of references as well that he he kind of said books and studies and things that he was referencing there. So, yeah, it was uh, it was quite incredible to spend uh, to spend the hour with him. So, uh, yeah, very very good. Yeah, and for me, I mean, yeah, I'm gonna have to listen to that again and go back through. I've written down a lot of stuff, but it's very random. But <laughs> Just to build on what Steve said right at the end there, or near the end, was, um, you know, he wants to be that guy in his 80s and 90s, and that's I want to be that as well. Um, but when people look at that and you say, like, right, you know, they might look at Steve and say, like, how, how do you do that? How are you like that now? And it's because he started in 1964. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, we're all, in our, we're all in our mid-40s now, even though I don't look like it because I've had my hair cut. 41. <laughs> all right well i'm in my mid 40s 42 <laughs> no, no, but you know i'm in my mid 40s i started training late late in my 30s and i was out of shape and I, I had knackered joints and everything i started training late in my 30s so it's not too late the best time to start was way back when but the second best time to start is now so you know if you're in your 40s 50s whatever you know if you're in your 50s in 20 years time you'll be in your 70s imagine how good you'd good and strong you'd be if you started now so you know well i think i think this podcast has given us so much to think about we should do a podcast about this podcast <laughs> where we actually <laughs> diagnose it and take it right. through because exactly. obviously that, as right? strength trainers as kettlebell enthusiasts as barbell enthusiasts yeah. as body well, weight i love body weight stuff you know we, we've had our we, we we you know we've been pushed to question things so um Damn right yeah and that's which is why that's we're here we said it? that in the very beginning didn't we we want to be challenged yeah. we'll be challenged. challenged we have been challenged yeah, but but someone who knows what they're talking about as well, which you know, which is we, we should we we should digest and see what we come back with. So anyway, needless to say, um, this is the health oddity. Please like, subscribe, and um, you know, just share this amongst friends. Loads of interesting talking points here. Um, so uh, yeah, I, who we got on next week? Do we, do we know? Tim Anderson, I think. Tim, Tim Anderson. Oh, wow. Tim Anderson from original. There's a perfect strength. segue because yeah. mm. Tim Anderson of Original Strength is all about that longevity. It's all about yep. listening to your body. So what a great 
combination. Steve Maxwell, Tim Anderson. It's going to be great. Anyway, thanks a lot, guys, and we shall see you all soon. You've been listening to Health Odyssey with Peter Lant, Paul Bassett, and James St. Pierre. To get your regular fix of hype free health, you can subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your favorite podcasts. You can find out more on today's and other topics at healthodyssey.com or find us on Facebook or Instagram by searching for Health Odyssey.